In this episode, I'll be speaking with Zeynep Trudi, CEO and founder of Trudi, a Turkish light company. She is also the co-founder of Study A Course, and she was named the export champion of 2020 by the Department of International Trade. Welcome to the show, Zeynep. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. You have an amazing list of um, qualifications. Committee member of Institute of Directors, European Turkish Brands Association's Dep Deputy Head, IVLP Alumni USA, that is the Entrepreneurship and Business Innovation Program arranged by Barack Obama from 33 countries. You've been awarded the most successful entrepreneur in 2011, and the list goes on. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you find the time for everything? But before I <laughs> ask you that question, I want to find out, are you a cat or dog person? I'm both, um, but at the moment I've got a cat, so <laughs> maybe I could say I'm a cat person. What's their name? Uh, well, his name's Leo. Um, I was brought up with cats and dogs, and my mum and dad always um, rescues cats and dogs. Uh, we've always had, uh, even a fish, you know, we've had all the pets a house can have in oh. our homes. Um, and I knew how how hard they were and how responsibility yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there is. You know, it's not like they're 18 and then they can go to university and then, no, you've got them for life. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so, but, and then when I saw Leo, um, he was a little kitten, and we actually went to um, get a cat for my sister with my niece. And when I saw Leo, I just fell in love with him and I just took him home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, amazing. <laughs> yeah, so. What a nice story. iPhone or Android? Oh, iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> Do you Max. Do you office working or remote working? Remote. Remote working. And, uh, is it a petrol, hybrid, or electric for you, for cars? Um, any. any. I'm up for <laughs> it all. As, as long as it takes you from <laughs> as long as it takes you from A to B, yeah, yeah, yes. no, no, that's, 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 that's a logical answer. Zainab, can I ask you, what did your parents do? Oh, um. So they came 50 years ago to London and uh, without any English um, from uh, from Turkey. And uh, after a few years, my mum went to school to learn English um, while she was pregnant with me. And then uh, she worked in some places and then um, they set up their own business and um, their restaurant and fish and chips in London. Um, and I've been working there since I was 13. Wow, wow. So yeah. the, the entrepreneurship comes comes from the family. Yeah, I guess so, because, uh, you know, if my mum and dad did something like that in London without speaking proper English, um, you know, we have to beat that. You know, <laughs> there's the bar set up too high. <laughs> yeah, no, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> what did you want to become when you were growing up? Um, you know, I was very... I didn't have anything in mind. Um, I was very open. Um, all I knew was um, I would like to travel and explore the world um, and not just live in and staying in London. Um, so uh, anything, and I, in fact, I said maybe the job I will do doesn't even exist now um, when I was that, yeah, that young age. Um, so yeah, and, but I did say the world's going towards computing, engineering, computer science, um, and which is why I actually went to university um, here, actually in Coventry University, um, studying uh, computer science engineering, and because I knew the world's going towards yeah, yeah, yeah. internet, con uh, yeah, computing. Um, but I just couldn't sit in a classroom and just, you know, I didn't have the patience, unfortunately. So I dropped down. <laughs> <laughs> and then you and started, you started my own business. Yeah. Your, 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 what was what was your first job? My first job, so if, you, if we don't count my dad's business oh, um, since yeah. the age of 13. Um, so while, uh, just before I started, started university, I applied for, um, in those days, maybe you know, it was Homeworld stores. They were owned by co-op. Um, yeah, 
it's like department stores, like Selfridges, you know, high-end um, department stores. Um, and I got a placement out of 3,000 applicants. There was five of us that got through. And I was like, wow. wow. I just applied for it because there were so yeah. many tests that we had to go through, aptitude tests, et cetera. And I was the youngest one. Um, I was only 18 at the time. And I said, okay, there's no harm in applying. Um, and it was actually a um, store management training program uh, for two years. Um, so we were, I, was, I was trained and the other five, um, well, the other four, we were trained on each department um, on how to run that department. So it was electrical department, mm -hmm. homewares department, fashion department, shoes department, carpets. We had it all. So, um, and then once we, uh, we, and there was banking and finance, it's curtains, it was, quite, it was quite interesting actually. So once we did all that um, and every department I was in, I managed to raise the income of that department. So the, the store managers and the area managers wanted to, meet, wanted to keep me in the problemed departments because oh. I was increasing, increasing the, uh, yeah. the yeah. profit margins in those departments. Um, and, and I think at that time I was, I was loving my job because um, I was the trainee manager at the age of 18 and I had a staff of 20 or up to 40 staff you know oh, it, was, wow. it was yeah um <laughs> but I didn't see it as my staff I was like the trainee so I was kind of down downgrading myself because pe people there were um they were between 30 and 40 years old so they were quite and the part-time ones were students and um I was quite angry with the students because they just want to go out and party at the weekends and yeah. not come yeah. on a Saturday or Sunday because when it was very very busy um, and we were just re merchandising the department and uh, it was always about us. How can we get more people to go down our route of the store and make them buy that kettle or make them look at that um, stove uh, cooker, uh, whatever it was, you know, um, we, we were allowed to be flexible on our shop floor. So I was quite flexible with changing things around with, with yeah. our merchandisers and with just a small few tweaks, um, I didn't know at the beginning. I just wanted it to look nice. Yeah, but then yeah, it re yeah. I realized, they told me that, um, Mrs. Mrs. Oscan, I was Oscan then, obviously. Um, well, what are you doing on this department to increase the sales? I was like, well, we did this and we did this and we did this. And then uh, well, they, they just loved it. Um, and then they offered me a great job um, and I refused. Um, and I said, I'm going to go back to university to do my computer science engineering because I knew that the world was going towards yeah, that yeah, end. Yeah. Um, and then obviously I went back to university and then from a management position um, for two years and then given off being offered a great job and refusing it because knowing that the world's going towards uh, into, uh, computing and science. And I said, we, we, uh, then we sat down in the lecture room and the, <laughs> being treated like kids, <laughs> I didn't like it at all. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I had a few rows with my um, lecturers, unfortunately. They were, you know, they were just treating us like, you know, I didn't like, I didn't yeah, like yeah, that yeah, yeah, treatment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I said that I, I could never, ever have a boss, you know, or people telling me what to do. I have a free spirit. So, um, yeah, so I left to start my own business. That's how it right, was. Right. Is this how through the started? <laughs> yes. Yeah, tell us, so, tell us, tell yeah. us about it. Uh, so um, it was another company name when I first started, um, and then uh, we changed the, the brand name to Trudy. Um, so in my house, um, I had a, a garage. Um, as as you do, you start businesses in your garage. Yeah, yeah, that's how <laughs> um, Amazon, Amazon started. Yeah, I mean, when, when I went to the Barack Obama program in, in USA, I was like, I don't have a story to tell. They're like, no, you do. You have to talk about your garage. And I'm like, oh, that's so embarrassing, your garage. I said, no, no, you know, a lot of, you know, companies out there start with from the garage. And yeah, yeah. But since then, I'm a bit more comfortable talking about my garage office. So, yes, it's it started in my garage and we converted it into an office. And um, in those days, obviously, there was, um, not a lot of information online um, and there was fax machines um, so I had you know I'd, I'd go into my office um, and then investigate what I should be importing because I actually was going to import um, uh, technology from Japan oh right yeah, yeah because I, I'm, I, I loved technology I still yeah, do yeah, yeah. Um, and using AI and it, all of that you know it's it, it, I enjoy it I, I like to learn more about it so um, I, went, I wanted to go to Japan and import some technology into the UK. And then when I realized, um, you know, don't speak the language, it's too far away, I'm Turkish, what can I bring out from Turkey? Um, the first thing came to mind was Turkish delight because 
my mum and dad always bought texture light in their luggages every time we went on holiday when we, yeah, when we were yeah. young yeah. and you had powder everywhere in the luggage and then it was used to go to our teachers our, our gps our next door neighbors um and then i was like why isn't it available in the uk market the true authentic texture light yeah so yeah, yeah and that's how the idea started we, we obviously checked out the market um, to see if there was I say we, I was the, I was a one man job then, then yeah, just yeah, me. Yeah. I checked out the UK market to see um, uh, if there was a real market in the UK or was, or was I just thinking that? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then, yes, it was, you know, in the UK uh, all year round, there wasn't real authentic Turkish delight with, uh, with a point of difference. And, and that's what we did. We, did, right, we just didn't right. bring the product from Turkey and just transport it yeah, into yeah, the UK. Yeah, yeah. We completely re-innovated yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. On how it was made 500 years ago, with the wow. natural flavorings and colorings, because yeah, in those yeah, days yeah. they didn't have any synthetic or That's e right. numbers. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we kind of went back in time. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the Barack Obama program. Can you tell me how you were chosen for that program, and and yeah. how old were you were? Can you just tell? Oh me no, <laughs> um, it was only. Uh, 2011, I think it was, so not too long ago, nine years ago. Oh, right. um, yeah. So the um, the U.S. Embassy commercial attache uh, gave me uh, the award that night, entrepreneurship award. And then when Barack Obama um, uh, kind of wanted, ev- well, out of 33 countries, he wanted to, do, well, he wanted um, entrepreneurs to come into the U.S. and they wanted to show how they did business in the U.S., um, how you would set up a company, a yeah, factory, yeah, yeah. or any sector, because um, there were so many different sectors in, in the group. So there was mm-hmm. uh, 33 countries. Um, I represented UK on that pro- project. And then oh. uh, we we had three weeks um, full full <laughs> um, a diary uh, with all different types of platforms from... Um, in the White House to UN uh, oh, wow. to Bloomberg TV and to really top top companies. Um, so there were, we were 33 countries and we were kind of taught how to um, shown round obviously and uh, shown how to set up companies um, and how to work with one another. It was a great project. Um, wow. And now I have 33 amazing friends from all yeah, around yeah, uh, yeah. the globe. Um, and after that, I got invited to the Hillary Clinton European Women. That wow, program was wow. Hillary Clinton program. Yeah, 100 women, 100 countries. Um, and I was invited to the, the European country, uh, 100, well, it wasn't 100, it was European ladies. Um, and then we have a connection via that as well. So wow, um, just, just seeing amazing entrepreneurs from around the world. And it yeah, wasn't until yeah. then that I realized that um, there's some more nutcases out there like me. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> the only one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how did you find mixing with different business cultures and how how did you find the benefits? You know, what, did you find it beneficial to mix with different business cultures, with different cultures, languages? How, how did it work out? Well, yeah, I mean, it, amazing. I mean, I learned quite a lot. And, and since then, um, I do give up uh, quite a lot of my time um, c- continuing on these platforms, mm-hmm. um, with friends, international friends, because we learn so much mm-hmm. off of each other. You don't have to be in the same sector. Yeah, yeah, um, we, yeah. I, I, we have a group in the UK, um, Mastermind Group, um, Institute of Directors, um, and we are from different sectors. I'm actually yeah. in the food company there. Um, it's, it, you just learn so much of each other. The international friends, um, for example, they might have an issue that I would say, for example, or another country would say, um, well, we do this in our country. They would do do that. And they're like, no, we don't, but we could do this. So, you know, just yeah, find yeah, the solutions yeah. for one another. Or like in your country, if I was to export my saffron, for instance, um, some country uh, wanted to export his saffron um, into USA. Um, and then they would say, OK, this is the platforms you could use. Um, th- th- this is how you could import. These are the certifications. You know, it was just kind of um, a learning um, program for me. Yeah. Um, and not just that. We, we went on to day courses and it was yeah, it was yeah, very, yeah. very um, interesting. I mean, education at the end of the day. Yes, yeah, I was a yeah, dropout, yeah. but um, 
I am always kind of trying to explore and, and educate mm -hmm. uh, myself on the sectors I'm in, or uh, it doesn't have to be the, the food sector, for example. It could yeah, be anything yeah, yeah. and that I find interesting because it's all about renewing yourself and, yeah, and looking yeah. at different things and a wider perspective. Absolutely. And um, as you say, we, we, there's so much we can learn from each other. And I also believe there's so much we can learn by mixing with different cultures. Um, I've seen some uh, good examples of this and, and, and bad examples. Um, you know, what we laugh at may not necessarily be with what other people are laughing at. Or yep. the business culture can be different. In some countries, you know, people take calls in the meetings. And uh, when we are not open to the, that culture, we may see this as a kind of disrespect or, or even like threat, but it's just perfect normal. Or shaking hands. Is it a firm handshake or a soft handshake? What is, what is correct? What is, what is the most important thing is being aware of the culture of the other, 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 other um, our counterparts. So that's so interesting. I mean, it must have given you an amazing, um, you know, opened your horizons mixing with all these different countries, cultures, and uh, how did it kind of, did it help you in any way to transform your, your business? Um, it made me look at uh, some of the countries in a different way. For example, they said, oh, we don't know what that product is. For example, mm -hmm. in, in the case of Turkish Delight, we do roasted chickpeas now as a snack, but at that time I only had the Turkish Delight range. Mm -hmm. um, and they would say, oh, we don't, we, our people wouldn't know of this product. And some would say, oh, we know this as lokum, which is another, mm -hmm. it's a Turkish word. And, and, and well, French call it lokum and some of the European countries call it lokum as well. And, you know, it just made us, look at it in a different yeah. angle because some countries knew about the product but called it different yeah, yeah, something yeah, else yeah, yeah, yeah. some countries uh, were found too sweet for instance yeah, china yeah, yeah. they found the product very sweet and yeah, they yeah, don't yeah, have yeah. a sweet tooth like we do for example yeah, 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 um, yeah, so it kind of made us um aware of of, of each product and not just services in general yeah, yeah, um yeah. i mean uh, as culture wise i mean um I'm part of, I think I can mention names, Department of International Trade. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm the export manager there. And we, we, when we went to um, uh, a mission uh, out there, I think we went to Prague, um, Eastern, Eastern Europe, um, they trained us on, on the culture of that part of Europe. Europe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they said that, you know, like the handshake or the smile, yeah, or yeah. being on time, um, writing an email. How, what kind of lang How you should write the email, yeah, and yeah, yeah. and you know, whereas the for instance, they said the Brits, you know, uh, they might mean this by saying this, but they actually mean this. Whereas, yeah, yeah, for instance, yeah. Eastern Europeans would say this and mean that. For example, yeah, you know, yeah, it, yeah. it was it was you know. So I do enjoy going to those training days um, and in, uh, and learn about the cultures and. And because I always traveled a lot and love traveling, exploring the planet, um, whether it's from the sky or down in the sea, <laughs> not just <laughs> not just land, um, yeah. I go out and see what kind of products are out there. And in fact, if I see a product, for instance, saffron, you know, which is a good friend of ours, um, but we went in met in the US. And if I see out there, at, you know, and I'm like, oh wow, this there's organic saffron here. Or even if it's not, so I'll take a photograph of the shelf and say hey, you know, you need your saffrons to be on this country on these shelves, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we kind of pass information on as well. It's just kind of that support to one another because, you know, we don't all get the opportunity to, to travel when we want to. Yeah, um, and yeah. I vice versa. So I'll get photographs from other parts of the world in, at the airport or in a store and say, hey, Zainab, I'll sell your products here and they'll take a photograph and send yeah, it to us. And yeah. I'm like, oh, wait, they're pay they're, that's quite an expensive price. They'll they're, they're put, put it up at, so, you know, it's like, I should be speaking to the buyer, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it's that kind of communication is quite enjoyable and fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's, that sounds very interesting, really. Um, what was your first year like in Trudy? How, if you go back to, I know you have to go back to a few yeah. years, but what was it like? You know, it's so easy for companies or, or people to look at you and say, oh yeah, well, say they build these companies and, you know, not an easy life, but you know, it's a, you know, there's everything in place, but it wasn't always like that, was it? You know, no, no, no. so if you go back to 17 years, can you tell us your first year? 
Oh, what is it? So, yeah, I mean, um, we, we like to see the tip of the iceberg, but that's, there's actually so much down below under the sea. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when I, I do at conferences, for example, I do talk about the failures in life and then what I've learned from them and how I've moved on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't see them as failures. I see them as an education and a learning curve on what I, ha uh, like it's 99 ways of not doing things that way. You need to do trial, try, try another way. Yeah, so the yeah. first year was um, a lot about um, uh, investigating where I could sell the product, marketing, um, and how I'm going to import this product. So um, I actually uh, went to Turkey a couple of times, got some samples prepared and everything, and just like a pallet worth of goods yeah. Um, yeah. to be delivered to a, a warehouse in Coventry somewhere. So what happened was as I was, uh, I, 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 I go back to this story a few times because it's so fun, funny. So I would be sitting in front of my garage well, in the garage, well, in yeah. the office, and then there would be a, a window in front of me, and I can see the road. And then the next thing I saw was a huge <laughs> a truck trailer trying to park in front of my house. <laughs> I was like, what is this guy trying to do? Then I saw it's a Turkish um, plate. And then me and my husband went out and was like, you know, what, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I've got a <laughs> delivery for Zainab Trudy. I was like, no, you're not supposed to deliver to my home address. This is the office address. You need to go to the warehouse. And he was like, well, this is the address given to me. So um, so all of those kind of, that was the first yeah, kind of yeah. experience, you know, we had. And then, so yeah. my husband, in that those days, there wasn't any sat-nav or navigation. So my husband actually drove in front of the trailer, the truck, and then took him all the way to the warehouse, which is only about 10 minutes away. Um, luckily, what if it was like four hours away, yeah, the warehouse yeah, address, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. because my husband, <laughs> home address and the warehouse address it was just luck that it was only 10 minutes away yeah, yeah. so yeah we took the, the truck trailer to the warehouse and we just the reason why i actually did the one pallet um uh shipment was because i wanted to see um though you'd kind of do all your research online mm -hmm. and gov, gov websites and chambers but you know you do all your research you don't really actually get physically the right sugar levy duties and right taxes and yeah, actually yeah, until yeah. you see literally the product come from a to b so i kind of took the risk and just uh, preparing all the documents out in turkey and then trying to see how that product's going to land here and and what kind of taxes i would be paying and and then yeah, from yeah. then on we kind of worked out how much the product should be priced at um we did some mistakes within product ranges because of the sugar levy uh, percentage changes uh, depended on each product we didn't know that we thought yeah, it was yeah, just yeah, all standard yeah. but no so uh, we learn uh, i say we i was oh, it's me just my man job i learned my way from doing those little mistakes and then trialing it rather than yes i did my research uh but i was i wasn't doing it for you know three years for example i, yeah, I did yeah, it yeah. and then brought the samples in continue researching continue, continue being educated but until you've actually got a very similar company in front of you asking them one to one, which there wasn't at the time. And yeah, um, you yeah. wouldn't know until you actually trial and test yes, it. Right, yeah. So, that's so what you, it is, yeah. you kind of learn the, you know, the hard way by by <laughs> try, uh, trying and you know finding did it work or did it not work. How how did you find your Turkish heritage helping you to to start your journey? But by the sound of it, I mean. Uh, I think you would, you would, you know, I think you were set, you said you had set your mind on an entrepreneurial journey anyway, but I just was curious, how did the Turkish heritage kind of helped or fuel this in any way? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, if um, I was, I was interested in uh, going to Japan and bringing in technology, yeah. but because yeah. I was Turkish and I thought I spoke the language correctly, which I didn't I realize at the time. Um, you know, there was so many misunderstood <laughs> miscommunication between us by emails, even by phone. Um, I thought I speak Turkish um, and it's only three and a half hours away. And I get to actually visit the country often because I would only go out once a year during summer holidays yeah, and, yeah. you know, and explore the country more. So it kind of ticked all those boxes. Um, that's kind of, it, it helped the language definitely helped me decide um, mm -hmm. to go to Turkey 
Um, and obviously, again, I think if, if I wasn't speaking English, I mean, because of that, it's, it helps to, to export to other countries as well. So if it yeah, was, yeah, yeah. if I was in, in a country where uh, the English language was a second or a third language, which is in some cases, I think that'll be more difficult for us yeah, to yeah. Uh, export rapidly, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. We would need to speak and learn that second or third language um, so we can communicate uh, within those countries. So we're quite lucky uh, that, you know, English, uh, <laughs> Is a language that we communicate yeah. in, language uh, and we don't find it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, very, very interesting. Um, I know when you started, you were working on by by yourself, and and but obviously you you then started adding stuff. What is your leadership style? How do you how do you manage? Because I'm not talking about just your um, your personnel in the company, but your external partners, and and you must have many partners you know, external resources. What is your leadership style? Um, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, they say, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to say this to, about myself, but they say that I involve everyone and get everyone's opinions um, and then make a decision. And I think that's how it's supposed to be, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just me, it's not me uh, in the company. Uh, I, I say to everyone, we're, we're all on this um, boat together uh, and we're holding this table. We are, every one of us are the legs of this table. We are all needed. It's not like um, I can do this on my own. No one can do it on their own. Uh, we need a great team and, and great team uh, suppliers. And, and it's not just that, you need a great team in logistics. You need a great team of suppliers. You need yeah. a great team of um, production management analysts. You need from A to Z. You, um, and it's not when something does go wrong. Um, yes, you you get fired up, you know, because yeah, yeah. 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 But and it does, um, it does things do go wrong, you know. This absolutely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing's like la la land. But um, when things do go wrong, um, I listen. Uh, and then find a solution and, and we're like, okay, what do you suggest? So I think uh, that kind of um, wins over uh, on how I look at things generally, um, whereas I take a lot of opinions uh, and then make that decision accordingly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice, very interesting. I mean, you you first you know tested your product in the UK, you, you, you probably planned it for the UK, and how did the international journey started? At what point? What made you to think that, hold on, I can also sell this in other countries. Can you take us back to, to this time and, and to that moment when you made the decision or when you had that light bulb, that thinking that, well, actually I can grow my business internationally. Um, I, think, I don't think it was ever uh, the, uh, that moment because it was always been in my head. I will start with the UK then expand because mm. I was always a traveller um, and we were always travelling since we were little. So with our family going backwards and forth to Turkey and we actually did, we went by car a few times. We had a little caravan, um, yeah, like a yeah. minibus caravan yeah, thing yeah, yeah, yeah. with all the kids in it. So um, we kind of took the routes of different countries and exploring those countries as we went along. And we still got photographs of it. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was in Greece. And oh, that was in, you know, France. And yeah, so yeah. it was very normal for us um, to explore those countries and as soon as when I set up a, com a company it wasn't never in my head that it will just be for the UK mm -hmm. I said it will I start see, from the UK and then I we'll see. export and then how we did we export um, so I would go to for instance there's exhibitions in my field confection exhibitions or food and drink exhibitions so I would go to those countries and explore uh, the exhibition halls the, the, the exhibition and the markets and the stalls um, uh, and shops uh, and the shelves and the pricing and then if I think my product can, is, is suited for that market then I would exhibit the following day uh, the following year sorry uh, and yeah, then yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, work our way around that way but it's never been a light bulb light bulb moment it's always been there you yeah, know yeah, amazing, and, and amazing. I think maybe, yeah. maybe because of that kind of traveling since we were little maybe that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the reason no, that's very interesting because you know, I look at many global companies, global brands, and and one of the things that I've seen is a common in bigger global brands. They design to go global from day one. 
and it sounds very interesting that you had the same vision from the from mm -hmm. the even from the start and has this reflected on your revenues coming from global markets i mean what sort of revenue your percentage comes from international markets um it's 40% wow. uh, and oh, all, yeah and and i never kind of um even businesses, I never like to put all in my eggs in one basket. Yeah. And I always use this yeah. term. Um, even in business, I have a few other businesses on the side as well, because we don't know where the world is going yeah, towards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have um, many businesses. You, you're a serial, <laughs> you're a serial <laughs> entrepreneur. I mean, I, I'm really impressed. But going back Thank to you. the international side of it, um, I mean, like Apple, Apple gets 58% of their turnover outside the USA. You get 40%. And and really, um, the vision, the international vision being from in place from day one must have made a big impact. And when you say to, you know, when you meet people at Institute of Directors or other networking events, and you tell them that, look, guys, you know, I do export in so many countries. What is the reaction you're getting? Oh, yeah, it's quite like oh, wow you know um you're amazing and how did you do, how did you do that and and it'd be like uh, yeah just go to the market you know you go on holiday you know go whilst you're on holiday um check out the stores and see if your product fits into that market you know go to exhibitions you know in fact you know when we first did our boxes we already had four languages at the back of the box oh right wow so that was you know it wasn't it, it wasn't just english we had the other yeah, yeah. The, the the languages uh, just in case from day one someone yeah, wanted yeah. to buy from france for example so we yeah, had yeah. the main languages at the back of the box so um i mean yes we i mean the export champion um title um it allowed me to speak to a lot of companies within the west midlands uh, on why i do what i do how i do what i do yeah. and and why i have that vision um and and it, Obviously now Brexit has kind of kind of made them step back a little bit. Um, but just finding it, and I think food sector is the hardest um, to import and export because the standards are so high and you yeah, have to have every yeah. certification in place. Um, and I and I'm very transparent on that. I we care about it very much with the branding and what kind of ingredients. And that's how it actually started because the texture light in the UK market I wasn't vegetarian, and I was vegetarian at the time. And, and it's actually supposed to be vegan because uh, you're not supposed to be using any animal fats or gelatin in there. It's made out of cornstarch. The original ingredient mm -hmm. is made out of cornstarch and sugar. Um, so finding kind of that in the UK market, why is it called texture? Like when it's actually not, it's made out of gelatin. So that was my, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that was my fight. Um, so I, I would have this conversation and why I would go to other markets and um, not every product can be sold in every market like i said you know some countries don't know your product some countries um, won't understand your product maybe they will need new you would uh, need to change the taste or the packaging uh and like we had the conversation uh we uh not every not every country buys the same product at the same time in the in the same season yeah, yeah every yeah. country buys different products at different seasons yes, yeah. um, because UAE would have their Ramadan for example that's when they buy gifts um, UK uh, UK would have their would have our Christmas in Australia for example their summer is different to ours yeah, so yeah, they yeah, actually yeah, 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 yeah. Ha they buy summer summer parties they buy more Turkish delight so it's our winter um, USA would buy more in during in spring so and the gift boxing I'm, I'm on about, for example, all the other products, you know, that we say is all year round for UK yeah, yeah. is not all year round for other countries. So exploring that market um, and not just by once, actually going there and seeing what prices there they could be sold at, what kind of offers, what kind of uh, different kind of packaging. Um, it, it, you know, there's so much you can do and, and adjust your product yeah, yeah, accordingly, yeah. according to the country you'd like to yeah. um, sell into. And also, um, you get so much support these days uh, via the the um, DIT offices around the globe. Yeah, I think they've yeah. got like two, they're in two or 200 countries or so. Um, and any country you'd like to contact, you've got probably a DIT office there that they can give you all that kind of data and give you advice even before you travel to see if your product's suitable mm -hmm. for that I country. See, I see, I see. 
I if if not, just you know, I, we we have a conversation. Just why don't just get on a plane and just go for two days yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and explore yeah. the market. So so really, really, when you have that vision of selling, because I believe growing your business, you know, selling internationally is one of the easiest and best ways to grow your business because you set up everything, you've done the hard work, yeah. and but going back to what you said earlier is is really enlightening because you're saying that look, go there physically go there and have a look at the shelves and look at the consumers have a feel of the country and then take some steps so so you never do anything on a gut feeling but now you mentioned that the it offices you can even get that information from those in country offices and that's that's very interesting and so so really it is a little bit of adventure but not really is it because you're taking a lot of you're making a lot of calculations, you know, by visiting or by, by consulting in-country resources about your products. But what also impressed me most is that you're willing to make changes on your product, not the core of the product, the core, the quality is the same quality, but you're saying that, you know, in those countries, the packaging and the time they buy. So, so you're really following your customers habits so you're not yeah. expecting them to follow you you're you're kind of would you say that this is like i mean I, i'm getting so far two lessons out of this is one is that go there and check it out and then to make necessary adjustments in your product and how did was it did it come to you instinctly or naturally or did you get this advice from 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 somebody or mentors mentoring scheme or did you just you knew this all. You knew this all the time. No, uh, I don't think we could never know all, all the markets. But because by traveling out there and just speaking to, yeah, yeah. like the store manager, for example, and and say, do you sell this all year round? And is it smaller packs or the bigger packs? And you know, just speaking to the store managers yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or or the people there and just observing, you know, you know, because not just going at one season, going at a couple of seasons to see what's yeah. changing on the shelves. I mean, in some countries, you just see a lot of vegan and gluten-free aisles, are huge in some countries, yeah, yeah. and some is not. So then you have to kind of maybe on your packaging, say gluten-free and vegan, so it can sit in those aisles as well. So you're yeah, kind of broadening yeah. your customers. And just kind of by going, once you're in those shop floors, and if you know your product, which you would know your product, that what you can do to adjust your product to sit on that shelf mm -hmm. and that particular aisle, at that particular okay. price, um, then it's, it's not rocket science, you know, you just change some packaging because you've already done the hard work yeah, yeah, and, yeah, never, so. and never put all your eggs in one basket. You don't know what the what's going to happen in that country uh, or whoever, if you're in the UK, okay, in the UK, we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe someday, uh, tomorrow, a huge confectionery brand will come up and just wipe you out. Yeah, um, yeah, therefore, yeah. kind of have uh, other... Uh, uh, revenues from Absolutely. different countries. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what when when somebody says to you, okay, look, you know, I'm too worried about exporting my product. Um, you know, it's, exporting is too complicated. How will I get paid? There's a lot of hassle and stuff like that. What would you, what would you say to them? Um, I mean, there's so much support. Like I said, the DIT. You can do performa. There's some letter of credit. There's so so many different ways. How would, um, you, how would you access it? Could you tell us, for instance, if if I have a customer or if I know somebody wants to sell to say Japan or Germany, what 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 would be the first thing if they wanted to access this information by DIT? How would they do? Is there a website that they could go, or is there a call number that they could call? So their local DIT office would be would they would offer you um, a person and an advisor that you'll be allocated an advisor and your advisor will be able to then guide you to com companies that can help you set up banks or companies that help you set up or look at different avenues uh, whether it's letter of credit via your own bank you can even ask your bank managers for you know mm -hmm. certain things um or even uh, uh like um uh, guarantors or whether it's uh, performer payments, they will give you a list down of options of what can be done um, so that 
you can sell ab abroad. Yeah, yeah. They can even do credit checks on that customer wow. to see whether they're credit worthy. You yeah. can have, even have insurance uh, covered by for that yeah, yeah, particular yeah. one customer. There's there's different ways, and and your advisor would be able to DIT advisor, which you'll be allocated one to, um, would be able to help you and guide you um, and mm -hmm. and offer you those different um professionals they they personally won't be professionals maybe as such but they'll guide you to the right yeah, yeah. people they'll make the connections yeah yeah, yeah. Um, for you to go to sell internationally what was the main driving force for you what was your main reason for selling it globally well i i, I thought um you know it's it's the turkish delight brand it's vegan it's gluten-free it goes back uh 500 years how it was done originally why should just uk people enjoy it <laughs> it should be mm -hmm. worldwide yeah. and it should be a worldwide brand you know and and it does take a long time it doesn't just happen overnight and and kind of it's it's never been maybe I, I, you know i don't need to be in every single country but the countries that know of the product and understand the product and would enjoy the product so I'll, i don't need to go to a country where it's going to be so hard to market that product because yeah, yeah. they don't get it. They don't have a sweet tooth or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not those countries, um, our target market. It's the countries where we think um, they would appreciate the product and, and enjoy it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So really, market research is a, is a key in that Definitely. respect to, to make a decision which countries to... to because um, I've seen some examples from, from the people that I've been speaking with because they haven't done their due diligence, a good brand, I know of a good brand that has gone to Polish market uh, without doing much market research and due diligence. And after a year, they were very, very disappointed. And as a result of that, they now say, we'll never sell outside the UK. So, uh, uh, you know, not doing their due diligence has led them to, to, you know, almost stop their further expansion because, you know, it, is so if, if a company wants to grow, selling globally gives gives that sort of um, that so much um, opportunities for them. Um, how um, what would be your advice or, or recommendation to a company kind of sitting on the fence about um, whether it should be should be not? And you know, with the, now that the, we are out of the European Union transition period is ending. So there is an element of uh, uncertainty. So somebody sitting on the fence, what will be your advice to them? I mean, what have you got to lose? Uh, yes, absolutely. Let's do our, do, uh, do the, do our um, market research on how much tax we would need to be paying for the product if it's gone, gone into Europe or whether it's gone into beyond Europe. Um, working out our costs during this time, because January 1st, we would know exactly how much tax we would need to be paying to import yeah, or export yeah. a, a product. So in the meantime, kind of just check the markets that your products would be able to be sold in. And then come 1st of January, we would be able to know the pricing. And then what have you got to lose? You know, you've, you've already done the hard work. Yeah, um, yeah, and what, yeah. what can and you've got all so much support. I mean, I wish I had that support at the beginning of, yeah, when I first yeah, started. Yeah. I, I would have kind of gone faster, you know, uh, big, yeah. you know, I would have grown much faster. Um, but um, maybe there's a reason why I'm growing slowly, and I'm, I'm quite we're quite happy with that because we can fulfil our customers' requirements. Maybe at the beginning we we might not have with yeah. all the mistakes that could have happened during the whole communication transit time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've got nothing to lose, you know, at the end of the day, it's business and business is all about risk taking. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What are the plans for 3D for the next uh, next five years? What can we expect to see <laughs> from your brand? Um, so we have launched a new product, uh, chick roasted chickpeas, and we've oh. innovated those. They're snacks, so they're gluten-free and vegan. Um, and they're in kind of share bags. Uh, we've got savory and sweet on them. Uh, so that's our next baby. And um, we've just launched it like uh, a year ago. Um, oh. And we're already selling into six countries. Um, and it's a completely different product and it's an innovation. And we're gonna rebrand it in 2021 and hopefully um, be the next best um, uh, gluten-free vegan snack in, in the market. So that's what I'm 
targeting myself. Wow, excellent. Wow, that's great. Well, maybe you could revisit the Chinese market because, like yes. you said, they don't have a sweet tooth <laughs> name. Uh, yeah. But having said that, I think even in China, there's so many variants. It's like, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, they're serving afternoon tea in Shanghai. You know, when I first heard this, I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's what I call product creation, you know, at it is best. And uh, Dunkin' Donuts are doing a similar thing for the Chinese market. They do like donuts with seaweed. And, you know, it is, I think, serving the customer, obviously, without changing the essence of the product. So, so you have plans for, for the future. And um, what is the biggest, um, you know, the, the part that I'm curious about, does the customer feedback play any part in motivating you to do more, to do further? That's an interesting question. Um, it doesn't motivate me, but I do get happy when they're happy. I mean, I have it in my head, in my vision, what I'm going to do in five to 10 years time. Um, so, cause I mean, with the chickpeas, uh, because no one was creating the products, we set up a factory yeah, to yeah. be able to supply the chickpeas that I have in my head, in my right, dream. Right, right. But uh, customer feedback is important. Um, so we have changed a few things according to the feedback that we receive. So we take them quite seriously. Um, and whether it's warnings, whether it's the size of the backpack or whether it's the look of it, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. So we have changed a few things around. Uh, so it's very important, but it doesn't, I wouldn't say it motivates me to do more for my vision in the next five to 10 years. That's already up here. It, that, yeah. that has to be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I see. Excellent. But, but, you know, I'm really enjoying this conversation. And one thing that I wanted to ask for the benefit of any company who is planning a, a global um, a growth, um, do they need to set aside any, um, any extra budgets or do they, is there something that they need to plan well in advance? You know, the extra spending, obviously the risk they will be taking. How, what will be your um, recommendations or suggestions on that? Um, well, I can, I can talk about it from a food point of view, food and drink point of view, because um, the only extra, uh, not, I wouldn't say only, but you would need the country, to, the country that you'd be going into, you would need the ingredients to be changed. And that's not an arm and a leg. You, know? yeah, yeah. you can do that for under a thousand pounds. Um, you, maybe you don't, you don't even need to change the whole website, for example, but you would maybe need to go out there uh, to exhibit. So that's, that is a bit of a budget. Yeah. Um, but that would be from your marketing uh, budget anyway, with the, the company that has allocated. Um, and, and some companies, I think, see marketing as an expense. We shouldn't look at it as an expense because yeah. yeah. that would turn around and come back to you. That's building your brand. So w these exhibitions, um, even if you don't get any business out of it, you've actually made them see what you're made out of, what your products are. So yeah. when you go again next year, and when you go again next year, that's when they'll buy from you and you've actually built up your brand um, awareness in, in that country. Yeah. So um, yes, you would need some marketing budget for it because of the exhibitions and maybe some um, uh, some offers, uh, dip depending on what product it is really, yeah, yeah. Um, just yeah. taste-wise, because we get our products to be tasted when it's launched in a, in a new store, for example, say in Australia, mm -hmm. um, in a chain. So they will be tasted and see, um, get the, the point, the, the feedback, the points of view, and then see whether it goes right in the right season. Again, you know, it might not be the right season for that particular product. You go six yeah, months yeah. later, it's the perfect season yeah, for that yeah, particular yeah, product. Yeah. So no, it doesn't mean no forever. It just means no, not now. No, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's another season and with another product. I'm, I say a product, I mean a different kind of packaging, the size wise yeah, or the flavors yeah. um, and relaunch again. You know, no doesn't mean no forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Are you worried about, um, uh, you know, when you go to other countries, are you worried about your product being copied? 
Well, if they're planning on to work as hard as I have, <laughs> voila. <laughs> they're welcome to it. <laughs> they're welcome to it, you know. Yeah. Um, no, I've never been worried. Um, there's even some other online businesses, platforms that I'm involved with and, and, and other projects. Um, I would keep them a secret until I've started. I wouldn't just share the information to everybody yes. and anybody. Yes. I mean, for instance, the website that we're about to launch in January, um, we've been on it for a year. Now, if someone's prepared to work on it for a year and then invest in that website yes. Yes. and the engineers yes. and the whole project behind it, and they're planning to copy it, then you're welcome, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then it will just make two of us uh, on the, on. Uh, yeah. Uh, competing with one another, which would which would kind of give us quite a good vibe and competition and price wise, you know, uh, we would be heard about it, which is, is great too. Well, it was actually a leading question because um, you know apparently it's one of the barriers that people come up with, say that well my product will be copied, you know, uh, but you know it's, that's why it was a leading question. I think there's not much to worry about it from the points that you say also. Many countries have got trademark uh, laws. Yeah. So, yeah. do you do you trademark any of your products? Yes. So the countries we export to, we've got most of the of their um, trademarks. Um, and if it's uh, uh, whether it's an IP, whether it's uh, a trademark, you know, if it's if it can be um, protected, protect it. Um, I, I mean, yes, people can get around it and do the other things, but if we're worried about that, we're not going to be able to grow. Yeah, We're not yeah, going to yeah. see, you know, just we don't want to put kind of um, horse shields on our face. My mom uses it all the time. So uh, <laughs> you just kind of look at it positively and say, you know, and, you know, uh, people have tried to copy us, um, but it hasn't worked for them because yeah, yeah. It, it looks very easy. You know, it, it, nothing, it doesn't, it's not that easy. So there's people out there that are afraid of being copied. You know how hard it is. Yeah. Um, and yeah. no one's going to be prepared to work that hard because it's your baby. It's yeah. your project. It's your baby. And you know how to, you would have a plan A, plan B, plan C. And they wouldn't because they only get to see the plan A, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't worry about that. Uh, they can carry on, do what they like. If they're prepared to see uh, and work as much as hard as we do um, and invest at the beginning, yeah. as, as like we did, um, they're more the merrier. Yeah, no, excellent. Well, my, my last question will be, Zeynep, and also please feel free to mention anything else. My, my, one of my last questions will be is, what tools do you use to gauge the culture of the country? Um, do you use anything like Google Trends to find out the trends in that given country? Or do you just um, go there and find it with your primary research? Yes, yeah, primary research. Um, yes, we do use some of that, but it, uh, I like to see, hold, and speak to people. Um, maybe old-fashioned, but I like to see on the shelf. I like to see what's selling, and I like to speak to the consumers and to the managers. Go to exhibitions, uh, go on those conferences at those exhibitions. See what the food experts are talking about. See what the buyers are talking about. See what they want. See the, what, what they're looking for. Yeah, um, yeah. And just kind of with the data that's available. Um, like the on my sector, snacking data, uh, vegan data, gluten-free data, it's a rising market for us. So it's a matter of kind of having a bit of a, a share of, of that market because that's what my market fits in. So yes, look at the data. Uh, also go out on the shop floors um, or go out in the market and then see it for your own self and believe in it um, and because it then you, you believe in it that that, that way yeah, yeah, more, yeah. I think, rather than just seeing some, you know, some data on a screen, um, you would literally see. In fact, this is the decision we actually also, I also make. So I would go to a country and go to all of the ranges of different types of stores. For instance, we have here Waitrose, Tesco's, Aldi, um, Morrison, and Sainsbury. So we have a variety of stores and the prices can change accordingly yeah, to yeah. this exactly same product, right? Um, so I would go out there and say, right, my products would fit into this, this, this store not on this, this, this. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. I can actually also see that. Um, or if I want to go into the other stores, I would rearrange my packaging according to those stores I'd like to be. Yeah, 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 so yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's to that you know, line um, and also being down on, 
on the ground, you know, being on the ground, uh, yeah, literally, yeah, yeah. rather than just sitting in front of a, uh, in, in an office. Um, I mean, you asked me whether I was remote or an office. Um, I say remote because I because I'm always traveling and doing those yeah, things, yeah, yeah. all these market research. And but I also have an office, and we also come to the office too. But it's a mixture. We have yeah, to yeah, have yeah. a balance, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not too remote and not too office based. It, it needs to be a balance. I think really. it's clear that you you need to be on the ground, you know, so that you get the pulse of the consumers, and um, and so that you don't that perhaps is one of the biggest strengths you have that. You know, there's no uh, surprises for you, no disappointments because you already checked out the, you know, the, the the what the local market wants and and made adjustments accordingly. Um, I actually just another thing I, maybe I, could, I should add. Um, we uh, have uh, sample days here in the UK in department stores and for instance Whole Foods, um, which I think I'm allowed to say. So um, we would do sampling days, um, and I actually went to a few of them myself. Um, not knowing who I am. Uh, so I would sample the ranges of products and want their feedback there and then, what they think of the packaging, what they think of the taste and yeah, what would yeah. they change. And I would note that it's, it's so valuable to get that information because you can't get that much yeah, from yeah. people that usually get your staff that or, or people that you hire to do the sampling days yeah, for yeah, you yeah, because yeah, we, yeah. we can't reach everywhere. So all, all the way, for example, in, in Newcastle, we have a lady out there that does all our sampling on, on that part of uh, the world, um, that part of the country. Um, but I wanted to do some myself. And, and when I did that, that was so invaluable information. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we would come back to the office and, uh, and rearrange, if we could rearrange uh, things to make it better. Yeah, 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 amazing. So Sina, um, if any of the listeners want to get hold of your product, how how will you know where will they find it? Is there a website or do, do they need to go to one of the stores? Yeah, no, they can go into the um, my website, which is www.trueday.com. True T R U E D E dot com, which is True Delight True Day right, com. Yeah. Or they can go and get it from Amazon. Um, yeah, they're all, all over the website. Excellent. Yeah, so thank you. Excellent. We'll mention that in the, um, in the in the text part of the uh, of the uh, episode anyway. No, it's, it's a great product, and um, you you must be really proud of what you have created and your progress. So um, thank you very much for sharing freely your journey and your experiences. Um, you know, any company that wants to go global, not just in in your sector but in any sector, mm. must have found this uh, listening to this inspirational and, and motivational so thank you very much for your time i really appreciate nice. thank it. you for having me and then good luck to everybody excellent thank you very much thank you take care bye-bye